Shri Tripura Rahasyam Mahatmya Khandam Aum Shri Ganesha Sharada Guru Bhyo Namaha Namaste. So last time we talked about Sumedha's vision of the goddess after his worship using the techniques given in this Mahatmya Kanda. Then after a year and five months, Devi appeared to him, blew his mind. <laughs> so after that, he went immediately to his guru, Parasharam. He went to his guru, touched his lotus feet with his head, and faithfully narrated the incident. Sri Bhargava Rama told his disciple with wonder, My child, blessed you are to see the transcendental Tripura Devi in your dream. There is no one more blessed than you who have been blessed by the transcendental Devi. Your dream was seen by me too. So, blessed you are. <laughs> This is the symptom of a real guru. The real guru is happy when his disciple makes advancement. He's overjoyed when his disciple has a realization. Huh? He's ecstatic when his disciple gets a blessing. Now, there are many teachers in this world who are jealous of their disciples who uh, actually contrive things to keep them back, to prevent them from making advancement. Why? So they can keep them as followers. See, but real guru isn't like that. Real guru is al already detached. He doesn't need disciples. He only takes those who are actually qualified for his teaching. And he never holds them back. If anything, he encourages them to go off on their own and do their own thing to reach their destiny. And we'll see that that's the case here. And he says, Now you will attain everything by your yogic vision. After duly worshipping Tripura Devi and obtaining her grace, you compose the Tripura Rahasyam text and teach it to deserving disciples. You should not tell Tripura Rahasyam to atheistic non-devotees. This is the command of my guru, and it is non-different from truth. So, now that Sumedha has got the vision of the goddess, he can tell her story. See, this is very much like the Ramayana. There are two Ramayanas, one by Tulsidas and the other one by Valmiki. Now, the story is very interesting. Valmiki was a great robber, a thief, a butcher. He used to just slaughter people and take their money and things. A highwayman. He would pounce on travelers, uh, unsuspecting people on the road. So, of course, when Narada came to that area, all the people came to him and said, please help us do something about this terrible Valmiki. So he said, don't worry, I'll take care. <laughs> so he went along the road where Valmiki used to hide out. And sure enough, Valmiki came to him and said, your money or your life? <laughs> and Narada says, I'll gladly give you my life, but just listen to me for a minute first. You know, killing all these people is going to have tremendous bad sinful reaction. After this life, you'll have to go to hell. Why are you doing it anyway? And Valmiki says, well, I have to support my family and, you know, get some income to take care of all my obligations. 
And Narada said, you really think that your family members are going to share in the reactions to these terrible things you're doing? Huh? I tell you what, I'll wait here. You go home and ask them. And so, <laughs> because Valmiki believed Narada, he was a holy man, he believed his word. So he went home and asked his wife and family relations, uh, will you share in the sinful reactions that I get from killing all these people? He said, oh, no way, man. <laughs> what you do is your responsibility. And if you do wrong things, you have to suffer. We have nothing to do with it. We're just your dependents. It's up to you. So he was struck. And he went back to Narada and he said, tell me, how can I get rid of these sinful reactions? This is terrible. I don't want to go to hell. Huh? So Narada told him, you should chant the name of God, Rama, Rama. And Valmiki said, no, I can't do that. I'm a really terrible person. See, by associating with, with Narada, he was starting to see the gravity of his situation. He said, I'm a really bad person, you know. And uh, Narada may have even shown him a vision of what his future was going to be like. So Narada tricked him. He said, all right, then don't chant the name of God. Chant the name of death. Mara, Mara. <laughs> Valmiki said, yes, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> so he sat down, he started chanting, Mara, 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 Mara. And that way, <laughs> see, he was tricked into chanting the name of Rama. This name of Rama is very special. Uh, this is called Namabhas. Uh, when the holy name is contained within another word or phrase that somehow or other trick the person into chanting the holy name. So by this Nama Bas, <laughs> Valmiki got realization. And then Narada returned. And he gave him the vision of the incarnation of Lord Rama, which at that time had not happened yet. So Valmiki had this wonderful vision and Narada said, okay, now you write this down. Here, I'll bless you and give you poetic and literary abilities. And you write this down. And this will counteract all the terrible things that you did in the past. So Valmiki, <laughs> the great thief, was turned into a great devotee. And he composed the Ramayana, which millions and millions of people chant today. So the name of Rama is so special. There's a shloka in the Vishnu Sahasranam. Shri Rama Rama Rame Ti Rame Rame Mano Rame Sahasranam Tat Punyam Rama Nama Varanane Rama Nama Varanane Om Namaiti. So beautiful that this holy name of Rama is so special that chanting one name of Rama is equal to three names of any other God. And even then, chanting one name of Rama or three names of Rama is equal to this whole Vishnu Sahasranam, thousand names of God. So let's just see. How fortunate Valmiki was. Huh? So a similar thing is going on here. Parashuram is saying, you attained the vision of Devi uh, by your yogic austerities. So now you have to write down her story for the benefit of the whole world. Uh, not that there was any problem that he had to overcome. He was a pure devotee. <laughs> But because uh, he was able to see the actual nature of the goddess, that he was able to write this book. And we'll see in the next couple of episodes that 
how he got empowered to write the book uh, by Narada. And Narada gets around. <laughs> so uh, a very important point here is that you compose the Tripura Rahasyam text and teach it to deserving disciples. You should not tell Tripura Rahasyam to atheistic non-devotees. Why? Because this is a secret of great power. And if the atheistic people who are non-devotees, they're not loving. Huh? The characteristic of a devotee is, first of all, he's a loving person. He's in love with God. He's in love with truth. He's in love with the holy name. And so anything he writes will have very beneficial effects. But if atheistic people get a hold of this secret and they misuse the power for their purposes, the effect of, on the whole world would be very, very bad. Disastrous, in fact. So something similar happened with the Tripura Rahasyam. As we noticed or commented on in the last series, that the Jnana Kanda was released in English before the Mahatmya Kanda. And the effect that this has is to send the message that anybody can approach the Advaita realization. Anybody can study this advanced philosophy and practices. Anybody can do this meditation and attain realization. But see, that's not true. This is why I criticized Raman Ashrama for bringing out their volume of Tripura Rahasya, the uh, Jnana Kanda, without bringing out beforehand this uh, Mahatmya Kanda. Because the Mahatmya Kanda is all about God, goddess, uh, worship, guru, sadhana, all these things. And so it has the, the power to ward off the atheistic people. Atheistic people won't like it. Huh? They'll say, oh, this is just folklore. This is just stories, myths. And they'll disregard it. They don't realize the truth of these things. And they're not loving people. They're selfish people. So, these people will be selected, will be filtered out by the theistic truths given in the Mahatmya Kanda. But because the Mahatmya Kanda was not translated into English at the time Ramanashramam published the Jnana Kanda, all kinds of unqualified people read it. And this gave rise to the idea that anybody without any background, without any qualification, can take up the Advaita path. And of course, this has become a disaster now with the development of Neo-Advaita, which is precisely what we're talking about here. We're talking about the idea that anybody without any qualification, without guru, without anything, without any background, can take up this Advaita process and realize it. Well, of course, that's not true. And they're going to fail. And they're going to fall down. Huh? But in the meantime, they're spreading these atheistic ideas. And because they look like they're following some kind of process, some kind of scripture, huh? because the Jnanakanda does not have a, a, a background of religious knowledge, uh, it assumes you already have that. So it doesn't put forward all these uh, theistic ideas and act as a deterrent. See, so anybody can just walk right in and do it. So this has led to a tremendous crisis today where you have unqualified people not only practicing but even teaching this Jnana Kanda. And this is a terrible disaster for the whole world 
because it has led to the spread of atheism in the name of self-realization. Now there was already a big problem because Buddha's teaching had been misconstrued in the same way. Buddha's teaching, because Buddha superficially recommended to people that not to pursue this religious path, but to pursue meditation instead. But who was he talking to? He wasn't talking to just anybody off the street. He was talking to qualified brahmanas and kshatriyas, people who had the theistic training, who had the background of puja and sadhana, see, who were actually qualified and ready for the path of raja yoga, meditation, and ultimately jnana, see. He was speaking within the context of Vedic civilization. And so in that context, what he was saying was right. It's like, okay, you've gone through all these rituals, you've done all these pujas, you've done so many sacrifices and this and that. Now you're ready for the next stage. So in that context, what he was saying was right. Forget about God. Huh? Just look into yourself. Because the funny thing is, <laughs> if you look into yourself and go deep all the way, you will find God. You will find Brahman. See, that's the truth of Advaita. But in the beginning, it looks like atheism. It looks like voidism. He's saying, give up the idea of God and just meditate on nothingness. Yes, at that time, in that context, in that social environment, and to those particular people, that was the correct instruction. That was the truth. But now, <laughs> now people have become atheists. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in any kind of worship. They don't pray. They don't do sac sacrifices. They don't do japa of the name of God. So they are completely unqualified. They don't even have a guru, for crying out loud. And most of the ones that do have a guru don't follow the instructions. So what can we do with these people? They need a remedial course in theism. And that's what this Mahatmya Kanda is. That's why we stopped our presentation of the Jnana Kanda and then switch to this wonderful story. Because the story itself contains the truths. The same truths that are expressed in the Jnana Kanda, only in the form of a story. And if you have intelligence, you can penetrate through the superficial frame of the story to the essence, to the truth that's embedded in it. See, that's what people don't understand. <laughs> so we're going to continue in this way and uh, bring you to the actual truth of Vedanta and Jnana Yoga. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Harihi Aum.